Namaste and Hardika Swagatam. A hearty welcome to the course on Introduction to Basic Spoken Sanskrit. Today we are going to look at the third lesson which is on sentence construction and its underlying logic. In your effort to learn a language, you would have experienced the challenges in learning the basic sound structures followed by the challenge of trying to learn up a vocabulary in that language. But I am sure that the next important challenge that you would invariably encounter is that of forming correct sentences in any language. Because the way sentences are formed in different languages differ in different ways. So, the objectives of this session would be the following. First and foremost, I will try and make you understand the formation of Sanskrit sentences. Secondly, we will try and focus on understanding the embedded grammatical coding in Sanskrit words. Following that, I will present a phil philosophical logic of its linguistic grids to facilitate the mental computing that takes place when we form Sanskrit sentences. After that, I would like to highlight some psycholinguistic implications and dimensions of Sanskrit sentence constructs. And finally, I would like to just introduce a few simple daily greetings so that you can already start applying spoken Sanskrit in your daily lives. So the first objective is to try and help you understand how a Sanskrit sentence is formed. So, the very first building blocks of any sentence is the subject and a verb. So, I'll write that out. Subject plus verb. So, let's take a very simple sentence which is boy goes. Okay, so it is the boy goes. All right. So now, around this sentence, you, the very simple structure, you can ask a few important questions. What I would also like you to do as we proceed in this exercise is to try and see what exactly is taking place in your mind as you are building this sentence. So, for example, when I say the boy goes, what is the picture that you have in your mind? You will have the picture of a boy who is walking. Now, based on this very simple structure, we will try and ask other questions that are directly related to this basic question, basic sentence. So, the question we can ask is, who goes? Right? Who goes? That is the question that is related to the verb. The answer is the boy goes. Now, let us see what are the different questions that one can ask around the verb to go. So, there we have the first one which is the boy goes where? Where does the boy go? And now, let us give that an answer. So, the boy, let us say, goes to school. Fine. So, let us draw that out. Many windows in the school. Second floor. All right. So, the boy goes to school. Next question. How? does he go to school and we can give an answer he goes to school uh, by or with a car okay Wait, I'll just make that a bit clearer for you so by or with car or a cycle we'll go with the cycle it's healthier. So, how does the boy go? By or with a cycle. Now, the next question is why? 
Why does he go to school? And for very obvious reasons to study. Or you can also put this as for studying. So, to and for are almost uh, synonymous in that context. The next question that one can ask is uh, from where? And the answer to that would be from his home. Okay. So, now let us put these into the picture. So, we have the boy goes to school and then how does he go to school? So, he goes by cycle. So, I will try and draw a quick cycle for us and okay. So, imagine that that is a cycle fine. So, the boy goes to school by or with a cycle for studying. So, let us just put a few books here. I will just put a few books here so that we know that it is for study. Okay. There is something written on that for study. And then the next very important question is when does he go? So, when? Now, when, when can we send him? In IIT's classes start rather early. So, we can send him in the morning. at 8 o'clock. All right. So, we have now in the morning at 8 o'clock and where is he coming from? He is coming from his home which is like that. Okay. So, from his home and in the morning at 8 o'clock. Now, if you notice what has happened is that we started off with a very simple idea of a boy who was going. And then as and when we asked different kinds of questions, what happened is that we started building the story in our mind and adding details to our picture. So, as there were details in our brain, different parts of our brain, another part of the brain was trying to corroborate that image through language. And as we know that the left brain is responsible for articulation of language and the right brain sees the world through images. So, when we are doing this kind of exercise of building a sentence, what we are doing is by adding the different questions, we are getting a greater clarity of the picture in our right brain and trying to find corresponding words in our left brain in order to articulate that particular picture. So, if we have to put the story together, we have the boy goes to school from home by cycle in the morning at 8, right? So, I think we have covered every point that we had given there and now you can also ask another kind of question. So, when you have the word school, this is a secondary level of questions. So, when you have the word school, one can ask whose school, whose cycle, whose home. So, the question belong of belonging seems to add an extended dimension to the very basic sentence that we have with these simple questions of daily life. So, now I would like to elaborate on this a little more. So, the final sentence that we have here on the screen is the boy goes to school from home by cycle in the morning. Um, there can be another question that one can also ask is with whom? So, I will try and include that here. So, with whom? And you can say at 8 with 
friend. All right. So it says in the morning at eight with a friend. All right. So now let's try and see what is happening with this sentence and how this sentence, when it gets translated into Sanskrit, what happens to it? So I'll take a new page. Yeah. And we have the basic sentence here. The boy goes to school from home with or by one second by cycle with friend the boy goes to school from home by cycle with friend to study in the morning at 8 i think in our previous sentence we had left out the word to study so I'm including that here so that the entire sentence is complete in itself. Fine. So here we have the boy goes to school from home by cycle with friend to study in the morning at 8. And uh, this particular sentence, let's see how many words it has. Uh, the boy goes to school from home by cycle with friend to study in the morning at 8. So that is... 18 we get 18 words eighteen words now what happens is that if I told you the word home if you had your eyes closed and I just told you the word home and you did not know the whole sentence would you understand what is the relationship of the word home in my thought process in my picture like is the person going to home or coming from home we have no clue what that word home by itself means but the moment I tell you from home the entire picture becomes clearer that somebody is performing an action from the house right so if we have to couple the words together with their prepositions it goes like this the boy goes to school from home by cycle with friend to study in the morning at 8. Fine? So that is it together. So now what happens in Sanskrit is that we have, we do not have the preposition as separated from the word itself. We integrate the prepositions into the word. And then what happens? Let's see. So what I will try and do is try to show you how this sentence can be written in English itself, but using the Sanskrit endings. Alright, and in that case, what would happen is that you can start understanding the construction of the Sanskrit words based on a language that you are already familiar with. So, we'll play a little game here trying to Sanskritize English and see what happens. So, we have the boy. So, boy is third person subject case. So, in which case we get boy yaha. Goes, because it's a third person present tense, we will get goes. And because it's in the present tense, third person singular, it will have an ending which is ti. So, goes ti. Then, to school. So, the school is the destination. So, in Sanskrit, this will get the, like an object case of a destination. So, it becomes... Schoolum. I'm trying to do it in two colors so that you can see exactly what gets added to it. Okay, schoolum. Then from home. It's the source point of his action. So it will keep the word home and then see what how the Sanskrit would add to it. Home. And then because it is from there, it will get the ending at home at. And then we have bicycle which is the instrument so it is cycle so cycle in Sanskrit is a feminine word and therefore the ending will be a little different 
uh, I will show you how it will form. So, it will become cyclaya. And then we have the word friend with friend which is also like an instrument accompanying kind of a uh, ending. So, then it will be friend but friend in Sanskrit is a neuter word and therefore it will get an ending which is slightly different from cyclaya. It will become friendena. And then we have to study which is the object or rather it is the purpose, it is not the object, it is the purpose of the action uh, and that will get the ending study aya. And then finally, we have the locative or when is the action been happening? It is happening in the morning at 8. So, in the morning at 8, we will get the same kind of prepositions in Sanskrit. In the morning will be morning, morning and the in, preposition in will get added as an a. So, morning a and similarly for at 8 o'clock would be 8 and then 8 a. Alright, so now let us see what is happening here. So, we have boyaha, goes the schoolam, homat, cyclaya, friendena, studyaya, morning a, 8 a. So, now what do we do? What do we notice here? One of the first fantastic things that we observe is let us count the number of words involved in the sentence and we have boyaha, gosti, schoolam, homat, uh, cyclaya, friendena, studyaya, morninge, ete. So, we see that we just have 8 words here, 8 or 9, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 words. So, you see how fantastic that is. Now, when you write it in English, it is 18 words for the simple reason that the prepositions are independent of the words themselves. But in Sanskrit, the prepositions get integrated into the word and come at the end of the word in what we call the forms of declensions or the different cases that exist in the Sanskrit language. We will look at that uh, following this particular exercise. So, now we have boyaha gosti skulam homat cyclaya friendena studyaya morninge ete. Now what we will do is I will give you the Sanskrit itself so that you hear what the original sentence which is a translation of the English sounds like. Uh, I will write it for you in the transliteration form. So the transliteration form is when we are using the Roman script but using certain dots and lines in order to indicate the longer vowels and different pronunciations of Sanskrit sounds that do not exist in English. So, I will write it for you in that because I am not so sure how many of you are already familiar with the Devanagari. So, the word is Balakaha Gachati Vidyalayam Sorry. Vidyalayam Grihat Dvi Chakri Kya. So, you are seeing where that is coming in. Friendena is Mitrena Patha. Naya Pratah Kale Ashta Ashta Vadane. That is it. So, I will also indicate to you how it is forming. So, balakaha. 
So Balakaha tells us that the boy who is a subject, Gachati, like we mentioned the tea that comes from Gozdi, Vidyalayam will tell you it's the destination, Grihat from the house, Dvichakrikaya bicycle, Mitrena with the friend, Patanaya to study, Prataka le in the morning, Ashtavada ne at 8 o'clock. So now you see how the sentence is framing up. But what you need to also recognize is that now when I tell you the word, let's say, I tell you the word uh, Vidyalayam. Now the first uh, subject case of the word Vidyalayam it's, is that it is a masculine singular word. So it would be Vidyalayaha when it is in the subject case. The moment I say Vidyalayam, you would understand that it is the object, it is the destination or it is the object of a person's action. So when you, uh, te when I tell you the word, once you are a little more familiar with Sanskrit and you hear the word Vidyalayam, in your mind there is a clear picture that it is either the destination or it is the object of one's action. Similarly, if I say Mitrena, it would necessarily mean with my friend or with a friend. Now, so this is how we build a simple Sanskrit sentence by understanding that words are not standalone. They incorporate the prepositions within the words themselves. This has certain very interesting consequences on her, how the words are constructed. Now the next part that I want to highlight as a consequence of what we have just seen is that every word in Sanskrit therefore has a certain grammatical coding that is embedded in itself. So, if I give you the word, the word boy itself, we will just stick to that first example. We have boy, we have Boyaha or Balakaha. Now, the word Balakaha has a few codings already into it. The first and foremost is that it is uh, telling you that it is a masculine word. The Aha at the end tells you also that it is singular. Following this, we have the uh, the H, the AH part of it, the aspirated Visarga, which will tell us that it is a subject. Huh? And then we know what the object itself is. So we have at least these three kinds of codings that is embedded in this word. So you know that the word BALAKA is a masculine word. When the moment you make it BALAKAHA, it becomes a singular and it is also the subject of your action. Similarly, when you have the verb goes, goes ti or gachati, there is a certain coding that is embedded in this verb. So the fact that we have a ti there tells us a few things. So it tells us first of all that it is the third person Then that it is singular, and that it is the present tense. Yeah, so that's where you have. So now you see how every word has a certain code of what is the entire information that is embedded in it. So when we say balakaha, masculine singular subject, gachati, third person singular present. Similarly, every word since it contains a code in itself can give us a direct package of the implications it has with the words around it before and after it. It tells us the relationship it shares with the different words that it is accompanying. Now that is what I meant by embedded grammatical coding of Sanskrit words. Next we understand that there is a certain philosophical logic of the linguistic grid 
of Sanskrit. So what I mean by linguistic grid is the following. That in Sanskrit first and foremost it is recognized that the singular is of course important. So this is one kind of grid. This is for the nouns. Huh? So you have the singular. But then they also recognize that it is not just the singular that is important. The reality of life is that the couple plays a very important role and therefore you have the uh, dual and when there is a single and then there is a couple you of course have the many that manif manifest. So you have the plural. In terms of the reality of the world also there is the beauty of the individual then there is a relationship of the male and the female, the dual, the purusha and the prakriti and then you have manifestation that takes hold with the plural. Now, as we saw in the case of uh, making the sentences previously, we see that there are different declensions or there are different cases under which the, the words are developed or the words are formed. So we had for example, the first was the subject which is also known as the nominative, nominative case because things are. So subject is the simple basic case. Then we have the second case which is the object also known as the accusative where things are become the object of your action. The third is the instrument. The instrument really means the by or with. So I will write it like that so that it is easier. By or with which is known as the instrumental. And then we have the to or for that, that is known as the dative. And then we have from which means the separation from the source point and that is the ablative. Now that which is coming away has a sense of belonging. So of which is the genitive. Then we have the in or on which is the locative. And finally there is just a recognition of the other in terms of a calling or recognition of the other which is known as the vocative. Now I will the philosophical uh, background or the logic underlying this is that we are so nominative. The second is that we have objects of our actions so therefore you have the accusative. The third is the instrument you do something with and that is the third case. Then you what you do with there is an exchange that takes place you give and you get. So you give to which is the dative and you get from which is the ablative and then whatever you give or get has to belong to that thing or belong to the person. So then you have the genitive and finally you have the in that whatever belongs to them has to be located on them. So it has to be in or on which is the locative. The last one is not really a case in itself but it is also part of this of the declensions and it is a recognition that that person is. So it is the vocative, hey there, recognition. So we see how with these 7 plus 1 cases, we have covered a certain logic of our existential relationship with everything else. So based on this, there are certain psycholinguistic implications that I would like to share with you. First and foremost, because of the way that every word is uh, clear in its relationship with the other because of the declensions that exist, we get an understanding of how different words are related to each other. Secondly, because of the way that every word therefore is independent in the meaning that it shares in the sentence, we get a certain unambiguous categorizing of the world around us and within us. So when we are looking at the world around us through the Sanskrit lens, we are forced to recognize the very specific relationship that everything has with everything else in order to be able to articulate it precisely in Sanskrit. The third and very important aspect is because the words are independent in themselves, the order of the words can be changed and it will not change the meaning. I will give you a very brief example. So if you say that the boy goes to school, 
In English, you can't say school to boy the goes. It will not make any sense. But in Sanskrit, the sentence would be balakaha vidyalayam gachati. Now, since each word, word is independent in what it is conveying, you can easily mix and match the order. So, it can be balakaha vidyalayam gachati, gachati balakaha vidyalayam, vidyalayam balakaha gachati, vidyalayam gachati balakaha. You can do all the permutations and combinations and the meaning of the sentence would still remain almost the same or more or less the same itself. Sometimes the meaning can change when you change the word a little bit because of the factor of emphasis. So if you want to emphasize something, then you would place it accordingly in the sentence. But otherwise, it doesn't make a change of the structure or the order of the words does not dramatically or significantly change the meaning of the sentence. Now, can you imagine if you are compelled to uh, order words in a particular uh, in a particular frame itself, like you have to go in a particular sequence, it sort of subconsciously can tend to format our thinking to believe that everything has to happen one after the other. But when one encounters a language like Sanskrit and suddenly there is no requirement to stick to a particular sequence, and we have the full freedom to change the order to our convenience. We can sort of develop a freedom in the way we perceive things. And it's in that context that I have tried to highlight the fact that one of the consequences of Sanskrit could be that it tries to break our uh, thinking, linearity of thinking and uh, convey the fact that the essence of the communication is important and not necessarily the form in itself. Uh, another important aspect of Sanskrit is the part of its, uh, it doesn't have so much of the self-referential I. Now this uh, is when I, when we say the verb, for example, I go, which is aham gachami. In English, when I say go, you have no clue. It can be I go, you go, they go, we go. All of these pronouns can be connected with the, or can be conjugated with the verb go. In Sanskrit, when I say gachami, the me at the end necessarily indicates that I am doing the action. As a result, I need not say aham gachami. If I just said gachami, that would suffice to communicate the fact that I am going. And therefore, one need not repeat the I, I, I in every sentence. Subconsciously, this can have a very powerful uh, effect in trying to lessen the degree of agency and ego that one feels and doership that one feels in life all the time. Finally, we have the, the implication of the frequent use of passive voice. So in Sanskrit, unlike in English, we tend to use much more of the, uh, the passive voice, not so much of the active voice. So similarly to the previous point where I said, I eat the apple. If I said that the apple is eaten by me, the apple becomes the important thing because now the apple is the subject and I happen to be the instrument of that action. So this is another way in which uh, there is a certain impact that this language can have on how we perceive ourselves as the supreme doers or rather more as instruments of actions that unfold in the world. I would just like to end the session with a few quotes here. When we were talking whether Sanskrit was alive or dead in our previous session, uh, we had Pandit Lakshmi Kanta Maitra who says that when the great philologists and scholars of computational linguistics wholeheartedly accept Sanskrit as the best and most scientific language of the world, on what basis can one say that Sanskrit is a dead language? And now the important part of how it can impact us psychologically. Sanskrit being a natural language, there is no question of its death. It is alive in the heart and mind of the people of India. As Professor Sampurnananda has said, Sanskrit not only is not merely alive, it is also a medicine to make the dead alive. These are things that need uh, to be thought about a little more. Like are they just broad claims or is there something, uh, is there some truth in these kind of statements that uh, these great scholars made? Uh, another potential social benefit of learning Sanskrit by Sri Gopal Krishna Sri Chandan, who was also part of a commission for Sanskrit, he says, not I, scholars say, even Western scholars opine, 
that if Sanskrit is taught to our younger generations, there will be a gradual disappearance of violence and disturbance from the social and national life. It will make people disciplined. The police budget of a state will get safely reduced by one-fourth of its annual provision if emphasis is given on Sanskrit teaching. So, uh, what uh, I would like to share with you is there is a school in the UK known as the St. James School as well as the John Scotus in, uh, in Dublin where little children are taught Sanskrit. Little children, little English children and Irish children are taught Sanskrit. And one of the things that their uh, teachers have observed is that when they are studying Sanskrit, somehow they seem to be more focused and much quieter than when they are engaged in the study of other languages. Now these uh, claims again can uh, need to be understood. Uh, these claims need to be uh, understood also from experience in many ways. And I would just like to end the session with uh, some simple greetings because we have been uh, talking about Sanskrit in the last three classes. In, to end this third session, I thought I would like to introduce you to some basic simple spoken Sanskrit. So in the morning, one would greet with Suprabhatam. Suprabhatam is formed of four syllables. You have Su, Pra, Bha, Tam. Su means good, Pra means more, Bha means to shine. And tam means that which has already shown. So in the morning when we wish somebody suprabhatam, we of course refer to the sun that is already shining forth. But more importantly, I think we should refer to the inner being which should shine forth in the morning. So suprabhatam. Then a question of asking well, the well-being of the other. Sarvam kushalam kim? Is everything okay? And the answer uh, desirably should be am. Sarvam kushalam, yes, everything is fine. And if on an unfortunate day when things are not going as per your desire, you would say, na, sarvam kushalam nasti, everything is not well. In the afternoon when you meet somebody, you would say, su madhyahnam, good afternoon. In the evening it would be, su sayam, at night, Suratri or Shubharatri. And finally, when we want to leave, we would tell each other Punar Mila Maha, meaning we will meet again. So, Dhanyavadaha and Punar Mila Maha. <laughs>